delighted uh, to have the chance to talk at this uh, health intelligence workshop. Um, I'll talk about augmented personalized health. I think the topic that I will cover in, to some extent complements the first uh, keynote uh, today in the morning. Um, as I will go, rather than community or public health level, I will go more on the personalized individual level and what is happening with regards to uh, the, our ability to create, you know, collect a lot of data about an individual. Uh, and the possible transformation or alternatives that uh, we can have in the healthcare, uh, how healthcare is delivered and what healthcare itself means uh, in this uh, thing. That's why I call this augmented personalized health, how AI techniques uh, on semantically integrated multimodal data uh, can uh, can support patient empowered health management. Um, just give many of you may not have heard at, uh, heard about Right State University or our center, the Ohio Center of Excellence in Knowledge and Computing. It's also a biohealth innovation center for, at Ohio State, uh, in the state of Ohio. And we do uh, projects on a broad variety of topics, um, particularly in the health area, a number of uh, NIH funded projects. Uh, uh, K Health as Asthma is what I'll talk about the most today. Uh, but about marijuana legalization issues, uh, dark web uh, uh, issue, the other exciting project on depression um, on social media. So, for example, clinicians would use a PSQ-9 uh, a survey uh, that they would give to the individual patient and to identify uh, whether they are depressed or not. Can we predict um, the depression level, depression and depression level uh, through the analysis of the content on social media of uh, active uh, social media users who may have depression. And so results are very encouraging there. We've done work on prescription drug abuse and uh, things along that line. A number of uh, NSF funded projects and many projects along the other lines. Uh, just to look at the healthcare related projects that we do, um, um, broadly speaking we try to you know really model domain knowledge, contextually relevant domain knowledge. Uh, and so there is a project uh, that, that helps us develop the uh, knowledge graphs. Uh, particularly, I'm not interested in very broad knowledge graph, but knowledge graph with regards to specific disease treatment or very specific health issue, in, uh, for example. And then um, also uh, we're working on things that are, there, there used to be a, a company called Alchemy that was acquired by IBM. Uh, but you give, for example, the text, and it will tell you all the entities and so on and so forth. With health, there are a lot of interesting uh, problems to solve. For example, uh, in a health text, I may want to understand what is the level of severity of the disease being talked about, or can I predict the level of severity? So there are uh, health-specific or domain-specific um, information extraction techniques that you have to apply, uh, develop, that is uh, using a combination of um, knowledge enhanced machine learning and NLP techniques. In fact, um, earlier I mentioned there is also a company that I co-founded that um, does computer assisted coding and computerized document improvement. At the heart of that is a very deep uh, knowledge graph that is developed for the healthcare and for the coding standard for ICD-9 ICD and ICD-10 uh, that then enables us to improve the NLP techniques good enough, well enough to be able to come up with um, uh, human quality of uh, prediction of the coding uh, that you may have, uh, that you may be looking. Um, and then we have projects uh, mentioned on depression, uh, asthma, bariatric surgery, or obesity, dementia, and uh, you know, variety of levels. Here, I just point out uh, health related investigations for public health policies and population level health, epidemiology, and personalized digital health. And in these different projects dealing with different disease, we exploit a broad variety of data. So uh, this is uh, physical cyber social data with electronic medical records, or, or social data, or social data plus plugin data plus uh, EMR data. And the point that you will notice here is that essentially there are broad diversity of broad variety of data that is available, and that you probably have to bring all of them together to uh, do a very good job in some of the health related problems. So with regards to various health related issues that we're investigating, dealing with all these different kinds of data in doing a different level of health-based investigations. Now, um, this is what I would call a, a revisionist view, uh, what uh, we can do now, or what we can at least think about doing now. So, um, 
ultimate goal in much of the healthcare has been about preventing the uh, sorry uh, treating disease but i think more much more needs to be done and much more can be done now uh, for uh, also preventing the disease and uh, while um, much of the uh, medicine is about uh, clinical care that is changing drastically and i'll show you uh, the seeds that uh, we are sowing that essentially hopefully would lead to among you know our work and many other people's work uh, in drastically change healthcare so here um, if you want to uh, deliver uh, sort of modern healthcare uh, we want to both uh, you know fight and prevent disease uh, we want to um, know uh, how we can do that so we uh, we ought to be able to predict the outcome and uh, once if we can predict the outcome then we can work towards uh, preventing that outcome uh, prediction uh, must know how one reacts uh, in order to be able to predict so um, many of you might have seen the medical insert uh, sorry the drug insert and you, uh, if you're not uh, you know you you're supposed to know that um, any of the medications that have been approved for um, uh, treating any medical condition none of them is 100% in fact many of them may be working only in 20% of the uh, people who are given the medication some may be working in 60% of the patients that also in the clinical trial that also on the uh, patients uh, uh, cohorts that are selected by uh, drug companies so in reality uh, there's a lot of variability among many different things it may be your genetics uh, for the same drug uh, one person with certain genetics uh, would would uh, you know really absorb the medication very well or utilize it very well to fight the disease other won't right so there's a you know um, you really have to be able to predict this um, outcome you know, for a treatment for example for that particular individual for that to be able to do data must be collected over a period of time to know a uh, reaction to, of the patient to uh, you know factors that may cause other uh, disease or that may cause the symptoms that you know manifest in the disease uh, but each patient is di uh, different so a generalized approach a one size fits all approach does not work that is why uh, we have to do personalized data collection patient generated health data and analysis again personalized analysis and that leads to what i call this augmented personalized health where you want to accurate, accurately predict uh, better management prevention uh, for one for that particular patient right so that's the kind of thing that we want to go towards uh, traditional healthcare uh, is done with limited amount of data uh, physicians are quite time constrained uh, that um, each individual is different uh, the medical care protocol is developed to work with many of the patients of the with the same kind of things but every patient is different so all these things are very hard to handle and um, this probably was okay when uh, the care had to be given purely based on uh, what you can what a patient can um, you know communicate with the physician or what uh, specialized tests can give uh, the information that uh, uh, lab tests may give to the physician that all those things are changing drastically so we want to go from paternalism kind of stuff to therapeutic and preemptive alliance uh, where going from where the clinicians make uh, you know uh, uh, the healthcare related decisions for you to one where you are, are really um, interacting collaborating with the physicians um not necessarily you know requiring a lot more time than what the physicians can afford to give but still uh, change it, that changes the equation in a drastic way so this so called therapeutic and purity alliance that i'm talking about um talks about you know is about very strong partnership between uh, the healthcare professional and the patient and that um uh, you know there's a lot more about you know the patient being educated about the disease patient uh, 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 you know being able to participate in that treatment and and management of the disease and i you like to use the word management rather than the treatment there's a lot more than the uh, treatment that needs to go in the future i personally for example would be a lot more interested in preventing that diabetes from you know if i'm pre pre diabetic i would rather work hard towards preventing uh, myself from being diabetic than to sort of you know treat it uh, you know uh, uh, after i am diabetic so a uh, lot of those things have to be done but there are a lot of challenges and uh, you know for example can we uh, you know for frequent interaction between patients and the clinicians 
So what we need to be able to do is to essentially uh, gain insights from the uh, patient-generated healthcare data, enabled by the so-called Internet of Things or the devices. A lot of them are, uh, you know, um, your Fitbit or um, uh, uh, consumer-grade devices, and increasingly there are a lot of uh, medical-grade devices that are available. A lot of more devices are being FDA approved also. And in addition to that, um, in the morning, for example, we heard about um, being able to learn from the community level signals. Well, that also has to be obviously brought in. So the social part of it, or the medical knowledge that is on the web, that has to be brought into the picture. And all of to integrate and analyze all of them, we need to try out a variety of AI techniques. So um, with this uh, patient-generated health data, um, you know, enabled by Internet of Things, we really have much broader digital footprint uh, of uh, patient's health. Right? So we want to be able to um, monitor health indicators that are sp specific to patient's health care need. We want to um, be able to continuously collect the data for long term, uh, uh, both uh, you know, for data that may be collected somewhere else versus data that is collected right uh, near the patient. The data would be of broad variety. I will show you in my example. And that um, you need to be able to look at all this data in an integrated fashion. Uh, just an interesting fact that, or statistics that uh, the growth of Internet of Things collected data uh, for healthcare itself is growing very rapidly. It will really grow extremely rapidly. So, in the end, then, the uh, healthcare uh, with the changing environment would you know, go from episodic to continuous, uh, clinic-centric to patient-centric, or a combination thereof, uh, clinical, clinician control to patient-empowered, and uh, disease-focused to, um, you know, medical, I should, maybe I should not have used the word intervention here, but, uh, you know, management of the health as broadly. And, obviously, we go from three, uh, you know, to 360-degree uh, data view. Just to give you an idea, Already, we have capacity to collect very large amount of data for any uh, for most uh, diseases. Uh, there is publicly available data on Kaggle, uh, where uh, just um, uh, you know uh, data collected for uh, with seven sensors for Parkinson's disease was 12 gigabyte, and uh, this is single you know this very limited form of data that is collected, right? Um, and uh, but now, as you see, the type of data we can collect is going to grow very rapidly, and I'll show you very specific examples of that. For that then, what we have to do is to convert very big data with that variety and volume, of course, into insights that tells you a lot more about that particular patient into actionable information, something that actually helps uh, better outcomes for the patients. Um, uh, in 2004, when I still had my second company, I introduced this term called smart data. So this is about converting uh, data into something that is really actionable for that particular decision making or for that particular individual. Right? Um, to give you an idea of the kind of things that have to happen, and this is where uh, you know AI will pay a lot more uh, attention, is that this is what a sensor gives you. You get 150. Right? And then you have labeled data. So this is annotated data. Uh, this is systolic blood pressure of 150 mmHg. That's that. This is data. This is information. And this is uh, knowledge that you have elevated blood pressure. You have that knowledge because you are using the uh, NIH provided standard that for a uh, Caucasian, um, uh, 150 mmHg of systolic blood pressure is a you know above the 140. Um, uh, limit uh, for um, non-hypertensive patient, and so this is hypertension. You know, uh, this is a rather elevated blood pressure, and that should be treated in a way. But that itself is not sufficient for a doctor to give you medication, because that could be elevated blood pressure could be because of hypothyroidism or hypertension, different disease, different um, medication, different treatment. Right. So going from this data. To this, which is action. Now, this is actionable. 
now the physician would uh, give you the uh, appropriate, you know, will discuss what classes, the seven classes of medication for hypertension, and then decide, well, am I giving you, um, you know, um, calcium channel blocker or some other new form of, uh, you know, medication for hypertension management. So what has to happen is essentially convert, you know, this thing into very high level. This is a smart data, as I will call it. This is a big data. The amount of data of this kind is huge. This is the smart data. This is one I can act upon. Physician can act upon. Patient can act upon. And uh, there are a variety of technologies, uh, you know, a whole series of things that you will do. This is just one implementation that we have in one of our applications, one of our systems. I won't go into detail right now. But there is a lot of work on, you know, semantic web technologies and many other technologies that, that come into picture here. So, this APH vision is to enhance healthcare by using AI techniques on semantically integrated P P PGSD, uh, uh, passenger healthcare data, environmental data, clinical data, public health data, and social data. Okay. What we want to be able to do is to be able to collect the data, analyze, analyze the data with knowledge. For example, the data is collected. My um, uh, interest is to understand this data in the context of potentially elevated blood pressure. Then I do need that knowledge. Uh, for example, I need the knowledge that um, hypertension, uh, you know, 140 mmHg, uh, systolic blood pressure, anything above that is hypertension. So I need that knowledge to be able to uh, convert this data and analysis into an abstraction. Uh, uh, that then is going to actionable information, and you continue to, and you can see here the kind of questions that you know you would ask. In the process, you will ask the questions like, uh, "What causes a particular, uh, you know, disease and its severity?" Then all the way to you could say, "How well controlled is my disease over the period of time?" And then when it is not well controlled, what do I do? That may be an intervention. So um, this is a uh, uh, health uh, management strategy uh, that we outlined. Uh, you start with self monitoring. So the people who wear Fitbits or uh, you know uh, uh, smart watches that collect uh, health-related uh, data, activity-related data, they are monitoring themselves. Uh, that data is often not that interpretable in the sense of you know what does it mean to a specific disease. So the fact that you you know walk 10,000 uh, you know, steps doesn't mean anything with regards to your directly. It doesn't mean anything with regard to your particular. Uh, need to manage uh, hypertension. Self appraisal comes in where you are able to interpret this data with respect to any health considerations that you may have. And then comes self management that suppose you have a disease and the doctor has uh, worked out a health care, a, a disease management plan for you. Then the self, man man uh, uh, self management would be how, uh, wh what deviations I have. And then what can I do to, uh, you know, uh, treat the deviation, uh, uh, take care of the deviation within the scope of the plan that has already been decided with the clinician. So, for example, uh, the clinician says, says uh, if something like this happens, take your uh, bronchodilator or take your Saba, short-acting, uh, you know, uh, medication for your asthma. And that is within the scope of that. The medication is already prescribed to you, when to use, what not to use, how often to use. Uh, there may be some flexibility. Self-management allows you to do that. When that doesn't work, so when I'm not able to manage my, let's say, asthma with the medications I have and the uh, directions are given, then I have to bring in intervention. A typical um, uh, 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 asthma patient uh, is asked to come back after three or six months. A lot of things happen, can happen in between them. And if um, the patient has multiple episodes of asthma, in, you know, on a monthly basis, let's say. Well, I think that uh, clearly what has been uh, prescribed is not doing well. You need to cover the intervention. And then you need to be able to study the disease progression and tracking how the uh, healthcare, you know, how, how well your, your health condition is being managed. Uh, are, is there a, a pro, you know, are you managing it well and you're well controlled asthma or is it exacerbated and you need to uh, take additional actions for that. Uh, are you making, you know, are, are you able to maintain in the pre-diabetic level or you are actually, you are, you are really going up uh, uh, with higher risk for diabetes, uh, diabetes onset? 
all these kind of possibilities, uh, you know, grow. Now, um, these are a couple of applications that we, that I, in this talk, I'm limiting myself to these two applications. Uh, one is asthma, and other is bilateral surgery patients. And both of them are, you know, uh, you know, huge. Uh, there are about 300 million adults and children worldwide with asthma. And in US alone, uh, 6.3 million uh, children have asthma. Uh, and um, uh, non adherence of medication makes it one of the poorly controlled um, disease. Uh, it is a multifactorial disease. Uh, this is important in that a lot of things can, uh, you know, uh, lead to uh, impact on your health, asthma. It may be a poor quality indoor air, it may be pollen outside, it may be particulate matter, matter. it may be um, other allergen out there, right? So there are many things that could. Uh, uh, lead to the disease, and that makes it a complex disease. And um, it is difficult to diagnose based on, uh, you know, <coughs> episodic disease and clinical data. I'll show you through real examples that the data that clinicians typically have is far incomplete to be able to uh, really uh, uh, diagnose and to be able to really understand the disease in an individual. Similarly, bariatric surgery patient, you know, patient uh, uh, well, there is a lot of obesity, um, there is increase the growth in there is a significant growth in uh, patients going through this kind of surgery. Broadly speaking, even though I'm focusing on bariatric surgery, we are interested in uh, addressing obesity and overweight and other issues as we go along. Uh, with the surgery itself, um, weight disease is a big problem. Uh, you go through this pretty serious uh, surgery, and then if you start to gain the weight back, uh, that's a big big. Um, you know, uh, negative result. So this is an interesting slide, and I think um, uh, what does augmented personalized health mean for asthma and bariatric surgery? And here you see that I have for self monitoring. I would say what causes my asthma sy symptoms. That would be an example of self monitoring. Am I taking the medication as prescribed? That will allow you to appraise how well you are doing with uh, your asthma management. Uh, did I forget to take the medication and encounter the symptom? Could it be that the symptom that I'm having because, is because I forgot to take medication? And then if so, then of course you should manage your, uh, you know, your, your health care better, and that is the self-management. Uh, though I take my medication as prescribed, I am encountering the symptoms, do I need uh, treatment adjustment? That would require intervention. And then my disease got worse during the uh, past two strings. Do I need to change the care plan, or should I improve my adherence? And that will, you know, it, that is a result of disease progression and tracking management and and, and uh, you know, some more advanced strategies. Similarly, you can ask a bunch of questions for a variety of level of choices that you can make. So basically, we are not only interested in preventing the disease, but also managing. Um, uh, the patient's health. And of course, many of the diseases are uh, uh, chronic health diseases, so they're not going to go away once they, uh, you know, uh, uh, are, are set in. So, um, I'll talk about uh, the use of um, this uh, initiative and application and, and, and the whole platform uh, that we have called K-Health, K stands for knowledge, but there's a lot more um, for both of these things. So that is a video. I won't go into the video because I'm covering. Uh, so this, so, the, so the, uh, the, but the video shows um, the kit that we have and the operation of the kit and those kind of stuff. Okay. So what is happening here? And this slide has a lot of things to talk about. So in our asthma control, we collect all of these um, environmental data, outdoor environmental observations. We get. Um, Temperature, humidity, pollen, uh, air quality. We get uh, patient-generated health data. So we get you know Fitbit that tells you about activity and sleep, peak flow meter that tells you about the lung functioning, and we have um, healthcare application, K health application, a mobile app that asks contextually relevant questions. And then we have um, indoor. Uh, air quality, uh, so we have FUBOT, which measures indoor air quality, uh, uh, the volatile compound, carbon dioxide, and particulate matter. 
So all of those things, um, many patients uh, get asthma at night, as an example. And um, you know, it could be that uh, uh, the carbon dioxide has gone up high uh, because of the operation of the uh, uh, heating system that is not functioning very properly. It could be that. It could be that um, uh, you know, so, uh, somebody cl cl uh, cleaned up the bathroom with a lot of um, chemicals uh, during the day. Uh, and uh, you know, bathroom is attached to the bedroom, and you know the air is uh, you know changed. That way. So all of that, uh, and then uh, in addition, we also uh, uh, have access to uh, anonymized data about the patient from the clinical note. Thus, we know what has doctor planned, what is doctor recorded in the clinical notes, and all of this data is being interpreted with respect to what has been decided by the. Uh, you know, in the clinical care plan. So you are collecting the data, there is all kinds of data, all this data being um, uh, integrated and I'll show you uh, a visualization of integration. This uh, data is analyzed uh, with regards to the standard uh, measures like uh, this is called, uh, you know, very high pollen of this red weed, uh, but also individualized, we want to get to individualized level because uh, two siblings um, have asthma one gets asthma uh, because of pollen of certain level, other does not, right? So uh, the standard measure may or may not be, uh, you know, totally applicable to an individual. Then you, um, you know, get actionable information. So you want the system to say, your asthma is moderately controlled, pollen is high, so take your rescue medication to prevent from the, uh, you know, um, potential onset of symptoms that lead to asthma. And then there are a bunch of uh, feedbacks that you can have um, that can further improve your management of asthma. So um, now this one that gives you a feel about um, you know our ability to analyze all the data. So all the data that I said is, that is being collected uh, that uh, uh, are immediately that are immediately loaded onto the cloud, and then um, uh, this is a visualization for all the data on the cloud. Uh, there's a little video about uh, this capability particularly. But here, um, for all my, let's say, suppose I have currently uh, uh, 20 different patients being monitored con concurrently, or 30 patients being monitored con concurrently. I think we have about 30 kids in operations right now uh, that are doing all of that data collection. Yeah, um, and uh, so he can tell you about in each of the patients and how, for example, what is the compliance of the patient? And the compliance uh, are, are different kinds. Compliance in terms of they're actually participating in this clinical trial, uh, whether they're giving all the data that they're supposed to give, whether their foobot is connected to the network, uh, whether they're answering the questions that they're being asked uh, twice a day. But also compliance, for example, you can, uh, uh, you can put in the compliance to the medication. Doctor has given medication, and if you take the puff, uh, the sensor tells the system, that you did take uh, this particular medication. So all that is being measured. And uh, you can get data about each of the individual patients longitudinally throughout the study for all of this outdoor, indoor, everything that I'm talking about. So you can visualize all of these things. And I'll show you the interpretation of this data. And um, uh, then you can start uh, studying this data. I'll come to uh, how we analyze the data very shortly. Uh, you can you know look at individual day. You can look at collectively what's happening to entire study, right? So let's look at um, uh, some data collections that we have done. So I you know now this is the first time I'm having a quality of data that are meaningful for medical decision making, uh, whether they are reliable, uh, whether you know what are the security and privacy considerations in terms of collecting this kind of data. Of course, the IRB is a big deal, particularly for such a complex, uh, 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 you know, data collection. So um, uh, it is after a rather long period of time when a lot of trials and errors that we have rather, uh, I would say now, reasonably perfected the uh, technology that we are actually able to collect, uh, get this kind of compliance. This is pretty good as far as I can tell, anyway. Uh, especially for anything that is other than simply, you know, uh, uh, wearing a Fitbit. If that's all you are doing, that's e e much easier. But when you have so many things that you're collecting, a lot of things could go wrong. Uh, so we have 1,325 days of, of data for 41 patients. 
with the average compliance of 89%, which is around 11, you know, worth more than 1,000 days worth of actual data of all of these things. Interesting thing to note is that per page, you know, you have eight uh, data points uh, for, for this particular thing, and uh, per patient, uh, data point per day, and, um, you know, for all, for all the trial, okay. Here, it tells us about the amount of data being generated. It gives you a, a sense of um, uh, both the volume and variety. So your pollen collected twice a day, your uh, particulate matter 24 hours a day, hourly, ozone, 24, you know, temperature and humidity, right? So you have the total of 41 patients, 846 data points and still collecting. Um, this is, tells you the total amount of data that we collected, more than 2 million um, data points uh, and uh, we continue to collect from a uh, variety of, uh, you know, from, from current deployments. So here is an interesting thing, active sensing and passive sensing. Active sensing means that patient is involved uh, and passive sensing means patient is not involved. And uh, from the very beginning, our uh, idea was to minimize active sensing because you ask patient to do too much work and they will, you know, give up and they, they won't do it. Uh, so the idea is to collect as much uh, um, uh, passive sensing as possible that is relevant. Here also take additional strategies. For example, you can ask contextually relevant questions. Rather than asking all the questions all the time, you can only ask the questions that may be meaningful. A patient seems to be doing very well. Passive sense is telling me that he's totally active, he's not taken any medication. Perhaps you don't want to ask some of the questions that you would otherwise ask if the patient was not that well. So those are kind of uh, things. So the number of data points per patient per day is 1,862, right? There's a lot of data. Obviously, no clinician is going to you know, look at all that data. This gives you uh, the kind of efforts that are uh, ongoing right now. So, for example, there is uh, this effort, uh, Google Wirely, um, where there's a watch that collects physiological data. Uh, this one is not about any particular disease, so this is simply about being able to observe the kind of data. So, uh, there is no real analysis of the data collection that is going on. There is a company that IBM uh, has signed up with uh, another company, and they are going to start collecting the data for COPD. Um, and uh, they have not yet started their work, but they are planning. Stanford Variable Study, again, some more idea of data. And, uh, and this is our dementia project. This is our uh, uh, ADHF, uh, decomposition heart failure. That's currently on hold. Uh, that's a bariatric surgery. Uh, this is a, a, a very interesting project going on. This is the largest healthcare related project, I believe, in UK going on with NHS. Uh, in that is about dementia. So a good friend of mine, um, Payam, uh, Payam Banagi, and his group are involved in this particular one. That's a good size, 350 patients. And ours is, um, uh, you know, the Astava project, which I think has probably the most diverse form of data that I know, I'm aware of, particularly, and, and that also to deeply analyze um, uh, this data in the context of particular disease. Now, here I give you some further insights. So, what happens here is that, uh, you know, this tells you about one particular patient, KH12. Uh, um, all this data is anonymized. Uh, what this is, uh, this is where the patient has taken uh, the short acting medication. Okay? And uh, as that medication, doctor has prescribed uh, for patient to take when the patient feels symptom, when patient feels there is a need to it, for it, right? Now, that, what that means is that we are trying to understand why, what change that uh, led for, you know, that, that um, you know, basically led to symptoms that patient wanted to manage, right? And there you can start seeing now, here you can see the unusual, uh, what, what you may call, um, you know, um, uh, the data points that you need to pay attention to are circled here. So you can see um, pollen is high at all these times. You can see particulate matter is high that time. You can see uh, ozone is high. Right, and uh, I'm only showing the outdoor. In, I can also show the indoor data, uh, but it quickly becomes very complicated. Right, 
from all of that data then, what you need to come or what we need to do is to come up with the reasons for that, causality in particular. So we need to start with co correlation, uh, then we uh, uh, sit down with the physician and uh, talk, o talk over and, and see whether we, he also agrees with us or we believe that, uh, that that's possibly causation. And, and sometimes some of this is statistical. So uh, the first time we just notice, second time we just notice. And then, after enough number of examples, we increase the we have increased confidence in our ability to say that indeed, um, you know, when such a situation occurs, as likely that you will have symptoms. Likely you, the idea then is to develop the strategies where you would uh, take corrective action as early as possible, right? So, for example, on the days where you have uh, this ozone problem, or particularly where you have, you know, hypotonic uh, thing you would advise the patient to remain indoor or in the, under air condition and not go outdoor or not keep the windows open. Those are the kind of stuff that you would be able to uh, you know, suggest to reduce the use of medication, for example, if that's, that's what they are willing to do. So um, here it gives you, and this is anecdotal, so I'm not giving you a complete cohort study here, but for this patient, we found uh, you know six symptoms and three use of medication and total events are seven because two of the user medications were, you know, uh, on the same day. And here we found that for each of those, uh, you know, uh, conditions, we found that in all the times, colon was high, or the colon seemed to be significant. So that's, that's a piece of correlation. We found ozone was high in six out of seven times, and we found a particle matter was high in one out of seven. This is an, again, I must emphasize, really just anecdotal. But imagine if I do this for sufficient period of time for that patient, I have fairly high, uh, you know, I think I should have very high, high, high confidence in what I'm able to understand. The fact that this, there is this kind of, you know, likely correlations are found, that itself shows our ability to, uh, you know, really get very important data. Now reflect on this one single thing. We clearly have medical conditions that needs to be managed better. How many of the patients actually have knowledge of what could be affecting them, especially of this kind? Extremely few. I would guess more than less than one percent of all the patients may be paying attention to these things. They may be aware that oh, in a rugby season, uh, you know, I tend to get allergies and that leads to my you know, constriction of bronchus and that leads to asthma attack. They may be kind of, they may have that thing after, you know, two, three, four years. But day to day, pollen changes drastically. There was a rain last night or whatever, you know, wind and other things, right? So most, this gives you uh, an idea of a significant potential for far better management of a disease than otherwise possible. Here is an anecdotal analysis of indoor air quality, where we found a correlation between uh, a volatile compound and carbon uh, dioxide, and uh, the possibility or probability of uh, you know that acting is co the correlation. Right. So there is this chances that we can find and as an example. So once you have all this data, then you uh, start. You know, obviously there are multiple factors. Uh, any you know, not just it's a multifactorial disease multiple factors and hence you want to be able to come up with uh, the ways for any one of these um, you know variables uh, that may uh, lead to uh, the disease so we are trying so that's where you know this data is being subject to logistic regression to be able to come up with uh, uh, this predictor function for a, that particular individual right. so again an important thing is that this is being done for one single individual so we are working towards developing this patient health score, answering these questions, how controlled is my asthma? And um, how vulnerable am I today? So, or, uh, you know, so the asthma can be mild, mild, persistent, persistent and severe. And um, uh, being able today, mostly patients don't have any ability to calibrate themselves. They don't know how well they are doing. Yeah, they may have symptoms, Yes, under certain symptoms, they will take uh, certain medications. But beyond that, there's nothing. 
Yeah, you can get color coded thing on your device that tells you how con well controlled is your asthma, right? And that uh, it can tell you that the doctor has given you, uh, told you to take long lasting medication, especially in month of August, and that you've not done that. And that, you, you know, your control level is poor, not as good as it should be, right? And so you want to put all this subject, all this with the domain knowledge for asthma. So we also have asthma ontology uh, behind the thing. So all those terms are meaningful, variety of terms, you know, variety of things have CVRT. You have, for example, um, uh, you know, uh, you feel allergic, uh, you, you have allergic, uh, you have, um, you know, uh, chest con tightness, you have uh, wheezing, uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, rapid uh, uh, breathing. So there are all these variety of symptoms that are there from low severity to high severity. All of them have to be modeled and factored in, in your understanding of that disease. And so you, you will do. The other very important aspect is how vulnerable are you today? So, um, uh, you know, like the system being able to say today the pollen is expected to be very high, especially ragweed, and uh, you've shown a high sensitivity to ragweed, uh, so make sure you take your short acting medication before you leave. That kind of stuff uh, is, is what we are working towards. Bariatric surgery, um, uh, again, there are a lot of people who uh, are obese and are overweight, and um, there are a number of challenges with regards to the bariatric surgery. Uh, patient acceptance and uh, active participation involving uh, continuous monitoring uh, to the, of the patient. This is very hard. Uh, and there are other economic issues that you have to worry about. But this is an interesting um, counterpart to the asthma thing. Uh, um, asthma is chronic. But here, a surgery, after bariatric surgery, you have to actually um, monitor patient before the surgery because major surgery, surgery. But after the surgery, you are, sub, you are, you are you're going to monitor the patient for 18 months. So it's a long-term monitoring. So uh, you know it will be very useful to be able to say four months into the, uh, four months into the surgery after the surgery that you really not keeping up with the um, you know uh, the target uh, because after surgery. If you start eating again uh, more, then uh, stomach, stomach can expand, and again you can start getting the uh, weight, gaining the weight, right? So uh, you know the deviations. If you can find out very early, far easier and better to manage than if you let you know uh, patients already 20 percent, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, patients already gain back 20, 25 percent of the weight. Things become much harder, and and, and the chance of your surgery failing. Uh, you know, uh, are, are increased. So uh, here the system that is capable of monitoring uh, patients, identifying non-compliance before and after, and nudge and assist for better compliance for improved outcomes and reduced recidivism. Uh, in terms of data, here um, we, uh, uh, there are different modalities that come to picture, including taking pictures of your meals, uh, trying to predict the nutrition from the pictures. So deep, deep learning and other things that, you know, on the, uh, so I, I'm a, um, an advisor of a company called Edemum that has, uh, I think, largest, one of the largest nutrition database uh, for all the recipes. And then uh, you are able to identify recipe or, uh, you know, the, from the images that you can you know, get the uh, other important um, uh, task is to be able to predict the quantity, quantity and the change in quantity. Changing quantity may be a little hard, less hard compared to the quantity itself. So uh, there are a number of challenging issues that we have to do. This is our current kit. So we have pill bottle sensor. We have Fitbit that gives you activity, sleep rate, and heart rate. Uh, this one reminds, we have application that asks certain questions, diet and emotional well-being through contextual question. Uh, we have pill, water bottle. This is a very important thing, water consumption, so we have water bottle sensor that reminds patients to hydrate and record it, and we have, of course, the scale, uh, very important. Right, so all of these are, uh, this is a part of our kit, and it's been deployed and uh, just early, but uh, patients seem to like it, okay, and that's wonderful. It's, it's uh, uh, a big load of my, uh, you know, uh, you know the, when, when the patients say that they, they like uh, using this, that was very good, so now we'll be able to scale up the uh, trial. So we aggregate data from all of these things and analyze and predict deviations that could cause the post-surgical complications and uh, also become assistant. Now, a, 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 as such, we also started to work on this conversational AI and building chatbot. 
So, um, for example, currently we are using uh, question answers, but uh, increasingly, um, um, I mean, many, you know, not everybody, you know, unless the disease is severe or they are really motivated, not everybody wants, wants to open up an application. So you want to be able to talk to, uh, you know, Google Home Mini or Alexa or any of these uh, uh, clients and, and, and just they will ask you some questions uh, whenever it's convenient to you and, um, uh, and, and, and that the, and the data collection will become easier. There's less load on the humans. So we are looking at, you know, your mobile apps on uh, smartphones. We, you know, we already have developed a chatbot for our depression project. Uh, it's very interesting. If somebody's interested, I'll be happy to send them a link to um, details on our chatbot for depression. Uh, and um, you know communication. To, it's an interesting thing. You can uh, certainly collect the data about it, but you can also uh, provide um, help. For example, social interaction is an important aspect of depression. And uh, you know understanding the emotion, understanding you know uh, uh, how a patient is doing. Uh, it could be, for example, nudging the patient to in improve. You know, first give first level of social interaction. Of course, machine interaction is, can only be so much satisfying. Or you can nudge them to, for example, reach out. You can make connection to the friends and have them reach out. Many of these interesting possibilities are there. And, then, and just important thing is, as I started out, you must, you know, there's so many possibilities for managing better health compared to going to the doctor, identifying, you know, where you are and giving you some pills, right? Compared to that, you know, the possibilities now we have is just amazing. So how do we solve this problem with all this complexity on vast amount of data, diverse knowledge, and come up with intelligent decisions that work at um, for an individual at a given time. Uh, so this is a work in progress. Uh, recently, I gave a keynote on um, semantic cognitive perceptual computing. So this is the um, uh, yeah. I don't have much time to discuss uh, any uh, the AI part of it and such, but this is the kind of work in progress where we have semantic computing that helps us deal with all the heterogeneity and different modalities and makes data meaningful. You can uh, semantic analyze all kinds of data and see, interpret the data, uh, from, you know, and convert data into information. Uh, cognitive computing. So this is to improve the understanding. What does it mean? Uh, what does that data mean in a context? What, does it, what that information means in context? And perceptual computing, that is uh, iteratively uh, go through the cycle of abductive and deductive reasoning um, and maybe prob and also probabilistic uh, uh, models to refine your hypothesis exactly what is wrong with you, for example, exactly what the options are. Right? So um, uh, there is a paper that discusses in great detail a uh, lot more detail about what the plans are and how we are going about this. But among the things that I didn't talk about today is historical data. So uh, earlier in the morning, we had a paper about population, le population level stuff. Those are meaningful too. I am interested, Dayton is the seventh most, um, seventh worst city in the United States in terms of asthma. So I want to understand you know, what's happening to the population, local population. I will also analyze Twitter to say the prevalence of asthma related symptoms people talk about as an example. But also, uh, increasingly, the number of uh, p uh, hospitals have created data. I was uh, earlier, I, I was doing my part sabbatical at, um, um, uh, in Singapore and working with um, uh, uh, the National University of Singapore, uh, 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 National University for Health in Singapore. They had collected data, all the data, for more than last 10 years in their hospital. And all of the data is integrated and available for analysis. That is treasure growth. So uh, on the issues like, for example, predict, predicting progression of progression of your diabetes, uh, this will be very important because you'll see, well, people with your ethnic background, people with, you know, this kind of um, activities and um, um, uh, other factors, and you put all of them in and get the information. So you, all of that is part of cognitive computing, as an example, and going, taking up the high level of abstraction to particular action is the perceptual computing as we have defined it. And so you go from health data to such things as your asthma is moderate control, take inhaled corticosteroid regularly. That kind of stuff, you know, reasoning is what the system should be able to do. All right, so um, uh, almost 100% of, actually 100% of my projects are interdisciplinary. 
And uh, so Dr. Kalra is our uh, partner for asthma, for bariatric surgery, Dr. Sut Shim, and my collaborators, colleagues, and students. And uh, I do have a, like, yeah, I have a rather large team. This is part of my, uh, uh, the Noesis team. Uh, I'm open to question at this time or anything else. The kit as a whole for asthma is um, less than $500. Let me give you a very concrete example of the cost. Uh, I'll talk about another uh, you know, application we have developed for ADHF, acute decomposing heart failure. In US, 25% uh, uh, of the patients get readmitted after, within one month after you know, heart surgery, discharge. 49% patient get readmitted within six months. Each year admission is roughly six days and costs $50,000, $8,000 or so per day, okay? $50,000 of cost. The kit cost for that would be $200 if you use their mobile app, uh, sorry, their smartphone. A scale, heart rate monitor, oximetry, and pulse, okay? Uh, and, and of course, question answer. So the point is that in some of these disease, the, if you prevent only 1% uh, uh, of readmission, you can make up all the cost of your technology. In other case, it may be 5%. In other case, it may be 10%. So it's obviously, you know, answer depends on the disease and the kind of things we go for. The other thing is, uh, I talked to you about this asthma and I have all these sensors, right? In this, you'll find out there are only three of them that are most relevant. Then there's no need for that patient to take all the 10 sensors. Only three is good enough. Or we may decide that insurance company agrees that this kit is, um, you know, I, um, good enough. It will it will reduce 80 percent of the problems we have. We go with that 80-20 rule, right? So there are a lot of possibilities there. Are there. For example, uh, suppose I take out all the indoor sensors, right? Then all the outdoor data is free. I have a mobile phone, all the outdoor data. I have question answering. That means I have zero cost. And if I feel that I can prevent 60% of the incidence is symptoms, remember I showed you, I showed you earlier, pol you know, the pollen and, uh, you know, this uh, uh, outside, you know, uh, ozone and other uh, dependencies, right? If you know, cost for, uh, you know, application that will do that for you is zero. In technology, in data cost. Of course, there's cost in the sense of possible nurse uh, paying attention to this or you making extra call to the healthcare facility and we need to figure that out. But then you make a call to the extra healthcare facility but you don't show up uh, uh, for in-person treatment. Great, you save money to the healthcare. So a lot of this are uh, um, you know, to be worked on and we are working on that. We just started to think about um, uh, uh, something for elderly, uh, giving healthcare to elderly and uh, cost will be an important issue uh, you know, in New York. So that's the question to be done. But I think that right now from what I see, uh, cost is a, um, a uh, small fraction of, uh, of what uh, you know benefits are. In fact, uh, I know that somebody has developed a bracelet for all the sensors uh, that I talked about, more or less. One single thing. So when I can, so today I'm buying sensors, multiple sensors, and putting them together in a kit. Tomorrow you'll have, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 this thing that is for uh, asthma. You'll have another this thing for some other disease, and all of that will be part of uh, uh, one single variable as an example. So maybe just a quick question. So I agree compliance is very important and patient engagement is key in that. But it's been shown that actually ed patient education is a very important component of improving compliance. I, I see that you don't have an education piece. You're not teaching a patient why they should be concerned about uh, taking a medication regularly or something, you're more notifying them of instances when they should do something 
rather than explicitly telling them why they should do it. Is that something that you're looking into? Or? We, we, we actually looking into that. We, uh, what you said is simply one step on how we uh, enact it. Um, but before we go there, we are and on the asthma, we are at a stage where we need uh, to finish this cohort of 150 patients. We are going to have 200 concerned patients. As I showed you, I give you data about of 50. Um, then we want to interpret and you know make sure that the doctor is you know in the loop and they are uh, you know they are in agreement. The change of the medical protocol and what you tell patient, what you don't tell patient. Uh, takes long time, uh, and uh, the other issue is to avoid the FDA, uh, you know, in the loop because we want to, you know, obviously not be seen as giving medical advice. So it is one thing to explain their data to the patient; another thing is to be seen as medical advice. So there are a lot of those non-technical tricky issue that we have to, you know, work on. We are actually in an you know, excellent position to explain. A lot of things, but it has to be explained in a very simplistic manner. You know, you know the patient does not have the same level of uh, sophistication about the disease. I know a lot more about asthma management than most patients do, right? And I'm not a physician, uh, so so to do that at the right level of you know uh, things. For example, the, our trial is with asthma in children. Who are we going to educate their pa uh, parents? In what way we are going to in involve their parents? So there are many logistical and non-technical issues that have to be figured out. We are in a great position because our techniques are a, um, um, so one of the problems, for example, in AI, in particular machine learning, and as, especially deep learning is so-called black box effect, lack of explainability, right? All our technology are knowledge integrated uh, processing. That means that we have a certain level of explainability of what is happening. That makes for us explanations far more easier. It is true that, see, when you get a funding, when you define a clinical trial, you have to make certain statements and certain things. Uh, otherwise, it won't get IRB approval, it won't get, you know, uh, you are taking too much risk. So you have to start with observation study. And then you have to go with, um, uh, if we have we have proposal um, uh, uh, currently pending, uh, uh, awaiting results uh, that involves intervention, self-management and intervention. So while we think we have technical capability of doing that, we are not able to roll it out because you know of the IRB and uh, you know other things. And plus, we also don't know. Uh, uh, just now we figured out that uh, indeed we are able to reach this high level of compliance. I'm very surprised, positively surprised that we actually have, you know, good patient uh, thing. Earlier we did not have that. Earlier we had a lot of problems, so we that figured that out. But you 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 are you're constantly worried that you would overload the patient with information, data, or engagement, and that also you know you, that's why I mentioned and emphasize active learning part of it. So. Okay. Yeah. So thank you again.